All right. So, um, so for this hour, uh, very delighted to have Jamie Stone as our keynote speaker. Uh, so Jamie Stone, correct? Sure. Okay. 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 All right. So, uh, so Jamie Stone hails from Johnson and Wales. Uh, it's from anyone know where that is? Johnson and Wales University. It's. I'm uh, sorry. Oh, you did say. Okay. It's in Rhode Island. It's in Rhode Island. Okay. So. And today you can see uh, what he's gonna talk about today is uh, pop culture in the mathematics classroom. Okay, so without further ado, I'll give you, there's uh, Jamie Stone. Oh, thanks. Okay. Hey, thank you. I feel as if I already know you guys <laughs> and I know how well you guys know me and all of my specials that will inevitably be out in the next few years. So anyway, yeah, uh, I am Jamie Stone. This is Pop Culture in the Math Classroom. And it's already not clicked. Let's see what's happening. There we go. Hooray. All right. So uh, yeah, I always have to put a table of contents into everything. So I'm going to just go through a quick background of my story, then tell you about how, what I consider to be pop culture, which, by the way, I talked for probably two to three weeks about in my pop culture classes uh, at JWU. So and if you hear me saying JWU, that's Johnson and Wales University. That's just the way that we say it. So I don't know if you guys just call Malloy University Moo or I don't know. Um, but we call Johnson and Wales JWU. So you'll probably hear me say that just a few more times. Uh, we'll talk about why pop culture is so useful to have in a classroom, particularly mathematics classroom, obviously. We'll talk some success stories and applications, and I'll have some time for questions and perhaps another fun game that, because I can't resist, I just, it's just nice. So uh, I know you all want to hear much, much more about me, right? So I'm just going to spend the first 44 minutes talking about myself and then the last minute talking about pop culture. So back in the early 1940s, I attempted to enlist in the United States Army to fight in World War II against the Nazis, but I was rejected due to various health concerns. Uh, so fast forward a little bit to me attending an exhibition on future technology with my BFF Bucky. I was recruited to be a super soldier experiment, transforming myself into the godlike specimen that you see before you. That's here, eyes over here, ladies. Not okay. So this godlike specimen. <clears throat> fast forward to me having to sacrifice myself for the good of humanity by pl flying plane to the Arctic Ocean, and suddenly I wake up and it's 1967. I then thwarted an assassination attempt by a supervillain trying to take over the world. Having been defeated, he decided to cryogenically freeze himself um, as he was launched into space. Naturally, having survived the time leap once already, they recruited me, and I volunteered to be cryogenically frozen myself in case that supervillain should ever return. I was woken up prematurely in 1984 to stop a cyborg assassin sent back in time from 2029 to kill a woman whose unborn son would one day save mankind from extinction by Skynet. While the assassin was eventually stopped, I'm pretty sure he'd be back. Sorry. I'm so sorry. Well, it doesn't get better. It gets worse. <laughs> But anyway, I tried to settle into 1984, but I quickly got very tired of hearing Footloose being played on the radio over and over again. So I hitched a ride in a time traveling phone booth with a couple of teens, Abe Lincoln, Socrates, Billy the Kid, and a few others. We arrived in 1989, and after helping them with their history project, I finally got my first job as a math teacher at James A. Garfield High in East Los Angeles. Woo! East LA represent. No? All right. So I don't know. You never know. After helping, I, I've never been to East LA. After helping a bunch of kids pass the AP Calc exams, uh, I was given a plaque of a future, a plaque of appreciation. And so I figured I'd found my calling. So I decided to stick with teaching until in 2023, there was an outbreak of the cordyceps virus uh, or fungus, sorry, which broke out in the United States. And eventually I was tasked with smuggling this kid named Ellie across hordes of infected people. Uh, I tell you more about that, but I'm pretty sure it'll take at least two more seasons. So, thanks. <laughs> wink, wink. Uh, anyway, so that's my backstory. Now, let's, let's talk about what culture is, because without culture, there is no pop culture. And again, this is where I, I, I have to tell you just straightforward. I'm going to try my best not to go off on a million tangents. 
just stop me. Be like, Stone, you're you're running short on time. I'm like going to keep an eye on time just to make sure because I literally spent an entire week and a half just defining culture with my class. Uh, so when I wrote pop culture of statistics or statistics of pop culture, uh, we decided to make the course half sociology based. And when we did that, we ended up going really, really far into the definitions of society and culture. So right now my background is like equal sociology and math at this point. But in any case, uh, I'm going to try very hard to just kind of briefly go through this for you. But for what it's worth, culture is a part of society. You don't have society without culture. You can't have culture without society. It's, you know, it goes both ways. But the word society comes from the Latin societis, which is from derived from socius, which means friends. And one of the most interesting things that I like to talk to people about is whether or not you can, in fact, have a working society without friendship. If you can't be friendly with each other, can you still have a society that works? Obviously, with society being defined the way you see it up there, which is just groups of individuals interacting in some way, you can call just about anything you want a society. We right now are a society. This is a society in this class. Uh, classroom. <laughs> I can't call you my class. I'm so used to speaking to classes. I'm just going to call you my class. In any case, Within this society, we are going to have our own rules, we are going to have our own norms, our own behaviors, and that is going to be the culture of this society, but that culture can change once you leave this society for another society, perhaps you leave with, you know, your high school soccer team for a national tournament and your plane crashes and you have to form a brand new society where a lot of terrible things happen and I'm not sure by looking around how many of you actually know this reference. That's not not as many as I thought but. If you haven't watched the uh, show Yellow Jackets, uh, I highly, highly do recommend it. Um, if you want to see what different societies look like, I would, I would be less surprised if more of you knew if I made a Lord of the Flies reference, maybe. So I gone with that society instead of the Yellow Jackets. Society. All right, duly noted. So <laughs> you never know. For what it's worth, uh, the whole society being friend or bust thing was not very popular back in the 18th century and the 19th century. Uh, one economic philosopher in particular, Adam Smith, uh, he argued consistently that you do not need to be friendly with each other. Do any of you know what the only thing you need in a society is, according to Adam Smith, in order for that society to function? It's utility. All you need is to be able to use one another. As long as each one of you has use to me, or I have use to you, we're good. We function perfectly fine. We don't need any friendship. I don't need to be friends with anybody, right? So, we're going to talk a little bit more about the culture part of this as we move forward, but again, remember that it is within that umbrella term of a society and that things change when you move from societies to societies. So norms, by the way, you see the word down there. When you're defining culture, we talk about behaviors and norms. There are a lot of different ways that you can define norms, but uh, I like this particular diagram because it includes four different types, which I usually talk about ad nauseum about with my class, but we'll start with values, which are just cultural standards for discerning what is good or bad within that society. Again, everything is going to be framed within a society. So what we find good or bad in here, you might not find good or bad elsewhere. You guys appreciating me doing the whole trivia thing before this is not going to be as appreciated by all of my students, I assure you, before class, right? Um, so just keep in mind that each society has different values. Beliefs are much more individualistic, but as I'm sure many of you already are aware of, confirmation bias these days is kind of at an all-time high thanks to social media. And because of that, people's individualistic beliefs become much more engraved within a society's culture because the more people that agree with you, the more you believe it to be true, regardless of whether or not it is, All right? So uh, it's... In the world of psychology, this is referred to as cognitive dissonance. You guys familiar with psych cognitives? Yeah, all right, some psych folks in here. Um, so basically, yeah, psychology. I love psych, but I'm currently learning psychology so I can uh, finish writing Science of Superheroes, which I'll talk to you about later on. But uh, in any case, like I said, I'm going to try real hard not to go off on tangents. Stay the course, Stone. Stay the course. <laughs> so uh, within cognitive dissonance, it basically means that your brains are not going to be very willing to accept information that's inconsistent with your pre-existing schemas that exist within your brains already. And this is one of the major, major points that 
connect pop culture to everything that I do because you need that shared culture. And if you don't have that shared culture, you're not going to be able to make those connections to your pre-existing schema. I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, have experienced at least one time in your lives where you've been sitting down in a classroom and a professor has said something that you're like, no, that doesn't sound right. And then what happened for the rest of the class? You just kind of zoned out a bit. It's not necessarily your own fault. That's that cognitive dissonance that's just stopping you from engaging in anything. So for a long time, the idea of culture in general was broken up into two different subdivisions, which were referred to, again, for a very long time as high culture and mass culture. The term pop culture actually came from the term mass culture, but we now see a lot more high culture being used by the masses and a lot more mass culture being used by those who have some sort of a power that would form what's known as a cultural hegemony. So we'll talk a little bit about that, but we start with high culture. Oops, that's not the high culture that I was talking about. <laughs> so here's the actual high culture that I would like to discuss, which again is formed by cultural hegemony. And what a cultural hegemony is, for those of you who don't know, means that there is some sort of an upper class or a ruling class or somebody with power out there who is dictating what should or should not be enjoyed by either those who are also in that class or even in the masses. So people typically consider high culture to be associated with these four things, wealth, power, intellectualism. And again, for those of you who actually get this reference as to why I put that picture on there, prestige worldwide. <clears throat> So for what it's worth, back in the earliest 20th century, a man named, and this is where I write down because I can't remember the names, Antonio Gramsci, uh, an Italian, he actually made a theory that journalists were entirely responsible for the cultural hegemony within all societies. And I mean, all societies, meaning that journalists are the ones that interact with the higher powers and they're the ones that produce the material that the masses are gonna read, thus having the influence from those higher powers. So it just rains down, it's trickle down economics, but with culture, if you wanna consider it that way, and it actually works unlike trickle down economics. <laughs> That's right. I, I usually take a quick break there to see how many people wanna walk out on me while I you know, talk about trickle, trickle down economics. I promise I won't mention anything more about trickle down economics. Mass culture, on the other hand, again, is anything that is considered to be mainstream. And again, in the world of pop culture, when we're going to define what is or isn't popular, most of what we see this day that is considered to be popular, at least by somebody out there, is also considered to be mainstream, which is why most people still think that mass culture is the closest link that we have to pop culture. So you have things that are accessible, you have things that may be considered lowbrow, uh, but again, nowadays, just about everybody has access to something from one of those levels of pop culture that you can find. And again, that brings us to the world of pop culture. So again, anything that is popular to one person may not be popular to everybody. It's very much hard to define what pop culture is. And in fact, a lot of experts in a lot of different fields have for a very long time tried very hard to define pop culture and failed. So here are a few of them. And again, I'm not gonna read all of them out loud to you, but these are some experts that talk about pop culture, uh, one, including one from my sociology text. But the last one is my absolute favorite, which just says that the concept of pop culture is useless, a melting pot of confused and contradictory meanings capable of misdirecting inquiry up any number of theoretical blind alleys. Yep, that is pretty much the world I am currently living in, just a mass of confusion and I, I'm sure you saw some of that confusion in my trivia before this started, right? So it's very, very difficult. What's popular to one person, what's popular to another is often very different. And to be perfectly frank with you, it's okay. That's not a bad thing. But we live in this world where we can define pop culture in all these different areas. And some people are going to call politics and religion pop culture. Some people are going to strict or stick strictly to media, like movies, books, TV, sports. Those are the most popular type of answers I get, no pun intended, when I ask people what popular culture is. They're like, oh, well, I just saw a movie that made a billion dollars worldwide. That's pretty popular, right? Yeah, by that metric it is, but what if you're defining popularity on ratings and not on how much money it makes? Oh, well, this particular $1 billion movie is rated at a 55 on Rotten Tomatoes. Is that popular enough? I don't know. 
or are you just so caught up in the cultural appropriation of Chris Pratt playing an Italian plumber? <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> oh, there will be many references. <laughs> you'll, by the end of this, you'll all get one reference, at least one. That's my goal. All right, so we're okay with the definition of pop culture pretty much not existing. Again, I spend two weeks trying to get my classes to actually define the words pop culture, and they don't. They all give me a lot of keywords. They all try their best. They all tell me their personal backstories, which involve what they think is popular, and they're all different, every single one of them. Nobody turns in an identical paper, and chat GPT, forget it. <laughs> so... Now we move on to the discussion of why we use pop culture in the classroom and the story that I like to use for this and the background that I talk about and why I got into pop culture in the math classroom to begin with all stems from one group called the underpants gnomes. Just, I have to ask, how many of you in here know what the underpants gnomes are? Oh, that's great. About a quarter of you, it looks like. So I'll take that. It's more than most of my classes these days. South Park has gotten a little bit old. Uh, so now I have to use references from Wednesday and then my students ask me to do that dance and I'm like, no, <laughs> but I'm glad and most of you know, or not most 25%, not most depends on what definition of most is. So the underpants gnomes have a flawless plan and they always show it off to anybody that visits them. And here it is phase one, collect underpants, phase two, phase three, profit. And that's literally how they say it out loud. If you haven't seen the episode, I highly suggest it. It's very interesting. And my first thought is always it's very sad, but this is exactly how I see the United States education system. And it's always a lot of plans and a lot of future goals and no middle where it's like, how do you connect these things? So I figured I'd show you a few of the most recent attempts at this. Uh, we'll start off with Obama's administration, which was, they did what was called the Educate to Innovate Initiative. You can read about it if you would like. Uh, it's pretty much readily available online anywhere you want. You can just Google it if you want to. But they had absolutely no connections between what they were doing in this Educate to Innovate in Initiative and reaching the top of the pack in science and math, which was their goal. And I'm sure you all know we have not met it. So... Uh, we are now a few years removed from Obama administration and nothing, no progress whatsoever for the Educate to Initiative, Ed, uh, Educate to Innovate Initiative. So then under the next administration where we had the single most unqualified human being ever to sit in an education position, and I'm not biased in saying that every single one of you should agree, regardless of your political background, that woman was terrible. Uh, she basically decided to get rid of all federal involvement and move it to just state only, seriously. This is this is real, in case any of you are like, no, there's no way she would have done this. Yeah, she did. She said that they were going to encourage states to prioritize STEM education. She didn't, there was no such encouragement. And she said they were going to engage with higher education institutes. They didn't. The only engagement that they did with higher education institutes was basically defunding them. So if you really wanna know more about what they tried to do for four years, then you can feel free to look that up uh, on your own. I'm not talking about it any more than that. So for what it's worth, uh, we are still now trying to figure out that phase two gap. And the current phase that we are in looks like this. This is what's happening right now. I don't know how many of you have actually heard of the You Belong in STEM initiative or if it's prevalent here. Uh, I know it's not something that we have yet discussed in Rhode Island very much, but maybe in New York it's a little bit more, but it's part of what's known as raise the bar STEM excellence for all students. And I will tell you that their goal, I actually wrote this down for you, is to unite government, nonprofits, professional organizations, industries, and philanthropies to take bold actions toward breaking down longstanding barriers for student success in STEM fields. Sound like a whole lot of words and a whole not lot of action. They have, for what it's worth, published a letter that they sent out to a whole bunch of different folks, including those in what I just mentioned, the federal government agencies, the industries, the philanthropies, all of them. Uh, and that letter is supposed to be used to access federal funds that higher institutes can use to enhance STEM teaching and learning, but we haven't seen any data for it yet. It's not available online, and I don't know whether or not it's been effective at all. So we'll see. Ask me again in two years to come back as your, your speaker yet again, and uh, Maybe I'll have an update for you. But as of right now, we are still in that blank phase two. And that blank phase two 
is generally where every single one of these three, and I mean it, every single one of them mentions at some point or another disengagement of students. At the very least, there is a common thread among all of these initiatives, and that is to limit disengagement of students. And so my focus, again, is on that engagement and disengagement. And I start off by talking a little bit about engagement for you. One of my favorite theorists of all time, David Ausubel, he wrote about what meaningful learning is. And he compared meaningful learning to what he refers to as rote memorization. Rote memorization is when you're studying for a test with those flashcards and you just try to memorize everything when your goal is to pass the test. And you memorize it for the test and then two days later, psh, it's gone, it's out of your memory, no more, goodbye, right? So meaningful learning only occurs, according to Ausubel, when you make connections. And those connections have to be something that pre-exists within your schema. So this is called anchoring. And I'm sure most of you in the education field of any kind whatsoever have heard of it before. Uh, but Ausubel actually was around up until 2008. He died in 2008. So he has a pretty contemporary view. And this has been looked at by a lot of different theorists in education. And not just myself, but a lot of different people really enjoy talking about meaningful learning. So same thing for cognitive investment. Again, a little bit more on the psych end of things there. Uh, active participation is, of course, important. If people are not participating, chances are they might be one of those folks that hear something that I said and zoned out. And then they're like, oh, that doesn't really fit with my confirmation bias. I'm, I'm going to just skip out on this. And of course, some sort of an emotional commitment. All these essentially mean the same thing, which is that the students are finally being engaged, right? They are actually learning in a way that they are going to maintain that information that they now have, yes? So they don't need to just rotely memorize something for an exam and then on your way to your degree, walk across the stage, get your degree, shake your hand, say goodbye, and get a job at McDonald's. So uh, who knows? Again, maybe you actually only take classes that you like. Maybe you are that one person that has paid attention in every single one of your classes that you have ever taken, right? Yeah, all of you are, yeah. Show of hands, how many of you have learned everything that your professors have ever taught you ever? Good. <laughs> so that's okay. Again, not me either. Uh, I will tell you that I slept through a whole lot of my 8 a.m. classes. Uh, not because they were at 8 a.m., of course. No, <laughs> that has no correlation. Anyway, disengagement, of course, being the opposite of that, where students are disinterested. They don't see any connection whatsoever to their real lives. And again, since I'm talking to a bunch of math folks, I'm sure all of you have heard the words at some point that I'm about to say, when am I ever going to use this? Right. Or maybe you've seen that meme that makes its way on Facebook all the time that says, oh, hey, another day has gone by and I still haven't used the Pythagorean theorem. Like, ugh, great. Yeah. I tell my students all the same thing. But math is not part of a core curriculum because we expect you to use every single thing that we teach you. It's literally showing your future employers that you can think in an analytical way that other classes are much, much less inclined to show. Right. Math has that power. Math has the ability to show that people can think right? That's why it's used on IQ tests. That's why a lot of IQ tests tend to be biased towards what a lot of people say are mathematicians and so on. Not that I believe that to be true. <laughs> anyway, so now we move on finally to the world of pop culture based classes. I have seven minutes before I want to get to the next part. <laughs> so I am, I'm like, I'm trying so hard to talk fast, but uh, I also want to slow down and smell the roses. In any case, Pop culture based classes tend to engage those students really, really well. I use pop culture in all my classes, regardless of whether or not the words pop culture appear in the title. The very first classes I ever taught that were math based, I actually started teaching American Sign Language. But after I taught American Sign Language, my first time I taught math was at the University of Connecticut, where I was getting my master's. And when I taught uh, calculus, I rewrote the entire course around Simpsons examples. And I mean the entire course, not one example I used from their text. And while the students were pretty ticked off that they paid a lot of money for this text that I didn't actually use, that wasn't my fault. <clears throat> no, not at all. Um, so I did. And they were like, you should totally take this and write your own textbook on The Simpsons. And so I reached out to uh, those people in The Simpsons and asked them if I could get their permission. And you know what they said? 
no. <laughs> they said, no, thanks. Um, there are books out there that they did approve, like The Simpsons and Philosophy and a bunch of other books that you can currently purchase at your famous uh, favorite bookstore. But they did not give me permission, so I did not write that textbook. But ever since then, I've been using pop culture examples pretty much nonstop. I try to use live examples too, but I do stick with pop culture topics and try to engage with my students in that way. And yes, uh, for those of you who aren't aware, uh, Jaywoo is a pretty famous, has a pretty famous culinary, like Emeril Lagasse graduated from there. And ever since then, we've had nothing but a lot of great chefs. I think one of the most recent winners of MasterChef or one of those shows came from Jaywoo. And yeah, we constantly get contestants on that show. If you're ever watching it and you hear the words Johnson and Wales, I now hope you'll think of me and not of them. <laughs> so, uh, as far as pop culture based classes that exist or are in the works, for me, I actually started at JWU trying to create a course called the Science of Love, which basically focuses on uh, algorithms to predict who your soulmate is and what dating what dating sites use for hooking people up together and all this other stuff and uh, what percentage of swiping right and swiping left means this and that and all this other stuff. And then I extended it out into the world of neurobiology. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with neurobiology, but I'm not either. <laughs> so I tried taking a course in neurobiology my very first year that I was working at JWU, which was six years ago, and I could not do it. I just couldn't connect to anything. Uh, I couldn't make those meaningful connections that Ausubel was talking about. And it might have been that the class was extremely boring and dry to me, but it may have been that it's just not something I'm very familiar with. So I'm currently waiting to finish up with Science of Superheroes before I go back to that one. And at that point, I'll team up with some of the folks at JWU that are more familiar with it than I am. But Science of Superheroes was the next thing that I tried to do. And of course, most of Science of Superheroes, you can probably bet, revolves around DC, Marvel uh, type of universes, but you can define superheroes in a lot of different ways. And eventually, the goal is to have these students debating whether or not certain superheroes can or cannot do certain things on earth that they can do off earth or without their powers or with their powers, what would and wouldn't work, how many calories would the flash have to consume in order to run very fast from New York to California and all this other stuff. Uh, it's all over the place. And the problem with it was that a lot of the topics that I chose like thermodynamics and optics were actually considered by JWU to be too hard. And I got denied. Sad. This is where you all say, aww. But I moved on with my life. And a couple of years later, I was actually uh, approached by someone who said, why don't you just make the course half physics and half psychology? Because uh, we have intro to psych courses and intro to physics courses at JWU, and I don't even have to make them prereqs. I can literally just write the course as an intro to both these topics with the backdrop being all of these superheroes. And I was like, sure, that sounds great. And so that's what I did. Of course, my background in psychology is, or was at the very least, weak. I now have taken a class in psychology and passed it. So now I'm working on rewriting the course in that way where it'll be half psych and half physics. And that should start in the fall of 2024, assuming that it gets approved. And it should get approved because the committee that denied me the first time I joined <laughs> um, and our our vice chair of that committee is also uh, in the math department. So we've cheated the system as much as we possibly can and we're going to get that class up and running in no time. But we also needed a course that uh, fits a requirement called ILS, which is integrated learning. Uh, and this particular course, Statistics of Pop Culture, is that course that I decided to write. They were like, can you just write an, an advanced statistics course that would fit in ILS? And I was like, oh, sure, I'll write it about pop culture and statistics. And so I did. So this is a actual course that's been up and running for three years now. Uh, it focuses on a lot of different topics, but I'll show you what some of them are in a moment on the next slide. And you can see for yourself which ones sound interesting to you. And you can talk to me about them. And again, if any of you actually want to know more about any of these and spe specifically, I do have my contact information at the end of the slideshow. I also brought along some business cards. If any of you want to take some business cards home with you to clutter up your kitchen uh, and your 
fridge, whatever, wherever you put the business cards. That's where I put business cards. They're all on, on the fridge. I'm running out of magnets to use those. So I know. Anyway, the others that exist are very numerous. It's ridiculous how many different courses exist out there about pop culture in some way, shape, or form. I just put three of my favorites on here. Politicizing Beyonce is a course that you can find at Rutgers University right now. Uh, philosophy and Star Trek is all over the place, but two of them in particular, uh, UC Berkeley and Georgetown, both have that course. Lady Gaga, Sociology of Fame, you can actually buy the book, and that book was eventually turned into a course that you can find at the University of South Carolina. So these exist all over the place. If any of you here are teaching at other universities and thinking, can I just add a course like this into my curriculum? Do it. It's so much fun. It really is. And the students love it. So here are some of the topics that you may find interesting from my world, which I created. Uh, Disney Bracketology was the first one that I did years ago. Um, I went to a conference for AMATIC, which is the American Mathematical Association of Tudor Colleges. And I happened to be going down to Disney that year. And Disney was where we, we, we held the conference back in whatever year, 2018, I think, or 2019. And I was approached to do a presentation on something. And they were like, well, you can do it on pop culture of some kind. It's like, all right, well, I was just having this discussion about this particular meme that I saw with this particular bracket. And if you go to Google, you can feel free at any point to find this bracket all too easily by searching for Disney March Madness. And this is one of the first ones that comes up. This has been around for over five years. In case any of you are wondering why it doesn't look like it's been updated ever, you're right. It hasn't been updated by this particular person, but that's okay because this was one of the worst brackets I've ever seen in my life. This is awful. This is biased. This is horrendously seated. And there are even measure of variable definition issues that you need to take care of. It's difficult to see, but the bottom left-hand corner there is the Nightmare Before Christmas. And for those of you who don't know, Nightmare Before Christmas was originally a Disney movie, but then Disney dropped it from their brand because they thought it was too dark. Then they sold it to Touchstone. Touchstone ended up producing it. And of course, it ended up doing really well. I would be shocked if any of you in here have never heard of The Nightmare Before Christmas, all right, or at least seen some merchandise. But as it was doing extremely well, Disney was like, oh, hey, we like things that do extremely well. Marvel, Star Wars, <clears throat> we'll just buy that too. So now it's considered to be a Disney movie, even though it's not. It's not a Disney movie by most definitions, and it shouldn't be. Then you have the seedings. And again, it looks like usually the top left and the top right are your one seeds. So the Lion King as a one seed makes sense. But on the top right, you see up as the one seed. And I've done statistics over and over and over again. I've surveyed literally thousands of people. And up is never, ever even close to number one, ever. Not only that, but they separated this into Disney on one side and Pixar on the other. And I can go on and on and on about how terrible this is. So we decided as a class, my statistics classes at that point, we're going to go ahead and revamp this whole thing. They were going to survey a whole bunch of people. They were going to get rid of the biases. They were going to make definitions that actually make sense. And they surveyed about a thousand people at that particular time. And then we we ranked it and we presented those ranks uh, data sets to Disney. And um, Disney <laughs> was not a big fan of me using their images in their likeness. So Amatic actually reached out to Disney and got permission for me to use their images as long as, and this is true, Disney owns my data. So if you would like to see my data, please casually send an email to me that says, I swear I'm not working for Disney in the subject line. And I will send you that data if you would like to see how we actually created the rankings to get the real you know, bracket. And if you would like to use my bracket, you're welcome to do so. But it's about three or four years old now, so it's due for an update. And soon enough, I will update it. Like I said, invite me back in a couple of years. I'll show you the updated version. Uh, I'm also not including live action in case any of you are curious. So <laughs> no. But in any case, that's just one. A uh, few of the other ones that I've done, I've done probability based on Halloween candy. You can look up a lot of different sites show like what the most popular Halloween candy by state is. And then they say it's like based on a survey of 100 people. Like, uh, okay. So yeah, <laughs> some of you have seen that exact study, I'm sure, right? Oh, I love those studies that come out. They're, they're everywhere. They, they show up who's, what state is cheering for what MLB team, what state cheered for which March Madness Final Four team and all this other stuff. 
Yeah, they're all over the place. So we did the real version of Halloween candy probability. I actually bought a uh, ring security system for my door for my uh, just for Halloween so I could live stream to my students during COVID. This is true. When we were all in the pandemic and we were very curious as to whether or not we'd get anybody trick-or-treating, we, we made fun bets with my students, meaning they could win points, not like they have to owe me money or anything else like that. If they lose the bet, they have to bow to me. That's the, in case any of you know how. If you've ever wondered if you can bet with your students, this is how you do it. You give them points if they win, but if they lose, they bow to you for the rest of the term every day at the start of class. And they do. <laughs> if you ever come to JWU and you see me teaching, the very first thing you're going to see at the start of class is five to 10 students getting up and bowing. So it's great. Yeah. In any case, we, we broadcast the stream live. Do you want to guess? I had a class of 20 students. And again, we were sitting at home during a pandemic. They had nothing better to do, but this was still a Saturday night. And on a Saturday night, do you want to guess how many college students attended my live stream of trick-or-treaters? 15 out of the 20 students actually attended my live stream. It was insane. They were that interested in it. Again, this is engagement. This is what I'm talking about. This gets them going. This gets them interested. And they love this. Unfortunately, I have to do Easter candy stuff during uh, spring, but I also focus on March Madness. So we literally just did a whole section on March Madness probability uh, for this particular section of my stats classes. I also do MCU predictive models. I, I assured you that will not shock any of you, I know, <laughs> that I do Marvel Cinematic Universe stuff. Uh, we make predictions about how much money things are going to make based on multiple regression models, ANOVA, and all sorts of other things. I've done normality of swears in music based on not only based on genre, but based on certain singers and whether or not certain singers tend to normalize the amount of swears that they actually have in their songs. It's fascinating. In case any of you are curious if it works, check it out. Just find your favorite artist that you know swears during songs so you're not going to have right skew. And just take a look, make a nice little data set. If you follow the central limit theorem and want to make your sample size at least 30, go ahead, whatever. But they will normalize a lot of the time. It's really fun to check it out. Um, anyway, we also did recently bias of tourist travel blogs. I found a couple of top 100 places to visit before you die sort of sites. I'm sure a lot of you have probably visited themselves yourselves if you like traveling as much as I do. And we compared the distances between locations that you're currently at and the places on that list to distances between you and the places you want to go. And we did random number generators to check out confidence intervals and all this other stuff and blah, 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 blah. Um, so in any case, it was pretty fun. And finally, we did some award season predictions, which was great as well. And again, I, I'm looking at the time and I'm like, I want to move on to my next thing real quick because I'm going to run out of time real fast. So again, Please, please, please feel free to email me if you want any of this, if you want my worksheets, if you want any of my data, if you want any, if you want me to send you anything, I'll send it to you. I have no problem sharing it. The only thing that I don't tend to share is my Academy Awards database. Uh, and the reason that I, I don't share it is it took me three and a half months to put together. I have about, I'd say, 200 columns worth of independent variables, and uh, it took me forever to calculate them, forever. So if you want that, uh, it is not currently available. At some point, I might offer it up. Uh, maybe if you decide you want to add to it or something, but beyond that, eh, it's that one's kind of mine. So that one is a huge file too, like gigantic. So, but again, if, if that's the only thing on here that interests you, let me know and we'll talk. So anyway, that being said, okay, I'm not going to get to the questions yet because I have one more thing for you. Uh, but if you want my contact information. There it is. If you want to write down anything again, like I said, I have business cards. Usually when I bring business cards to anything, I give away like three or four of them. So I brought like 30 this time. And I know that there's not enough business cards for everybody in here. So I'm not just going to pass them around. If you just genuinely want them, you can have them. If you want to write down my info, feel free. Uh, and if you want to pet my dog, you're going to have to come to Rhode Island. He's adorable. His name is Franklin. That's that's Franklin. That was us in Acadia. If any of you have been to Acadia National Park, that's that's where we were. And yeah, he's very cute. So, <laughs> okay. So again, I'm going to hold off on questions real quick. I will take questions right after this, but I do have a fun little activity for you that I always like to do. Um, and this is for prizes. So, oh yeah, I bring prizes. <laughs> so here we go. I'm going to go ahead and open up Kahoot. And for those of you who have never played Kahoot before, oh, 
some of you have played Kahoot before and you already know. So close your eyes for a second. Ah, hold on. Okay, you can open your eyes. <laughs> All right, we're playing the classic mode, and here we go. So for those of you, again, who have not played Kahoot before, you can go to kahoot.it, or you can scan the QR code up there. It's up to you, but you just enter in the pin, and you enter in whatever name you want. You can enter in nicknames or something else. It's totally up to you. There's going to be 10 questions. All of them will appear on your screen, so if you're worried about not actually seeing the question from wherever you're sitting or seeing the image, you will be able to see them on your screen, so don't worry about it. I'll give you a couple of minutes for those of you who want to play. As you're signing in, I will tell you about the prizes. I'm giving away prizes for the top three because this is genuinely a hard game. Uh, and it is based on how fast you get them right. I don't expect any of you to get 10 out of 10. If any of you get 10 out of 10 on this game, I will truly be impressed, like truly impressed. All right. Yeah, um, this is some pop culture, some random math type things that I just thought were fun and we'll go from there. Um, but the prizes for my top three are this. Now, this may look unassuming to many of you, but this is very special. This is a Spider-Man desk buddy from the Spider-Man Homecoming release a few years back. And AMC movie theaters gave these away as prizes. And when somebody who will remain <clears throat> nameless works as a manager in a movie theater that he can just close the doors after you know 1 a.m. when everybody's gone. And then all of a sudden, one of the cases of these prizes just happens to make its way to my car. Oh, shoot, I'm being recorded. Never mind. I got these totally legit. Uh, this is again a Spider-Man desk buddy, and it will sit happily on the top of your computer screen. That's where mine is in my my office right now at JWU. I have this guy literally sitting down on my screen, and he just kind of stares at you. Uh, if you really don't like Spider-Man, or if you really want to know how much this is worth, they tend to sell for like ten to twenty bucks on eBay now. They're not easy to find, um, mostly because again they somehow end up in AMC managers' cars at the end of the night. Uh, not going to say who. All right. We ready? Anybody having trouble logging in? Are we good? Sure. Well, yeah, I can give another minute. You want me to bring up my uh, my trivia round again? <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> one, way, one way to get you guys through lunch, just to post random trivia. Uh, and again, I have one for first, second, and third place. They are wrapped, so, you know, if you want it, if you really don't want it, which will only make me slightly sad, then you can sell it online if you really want. Uh, each one of these has a 20-second time limit, so make sure that you get in your answer within that 20 seconds. That's all that I have to say about that, but by the time we're done, I will ask who the top three are when you can see the podium, and we'll be good to go. Ready? All right, so like I said, there's just 10 questions. This won't take very long. I'm not gonna run into the next person and I'll have time for questions. So ready, here we go. If any of you are really hoping desperately for that Kahoot music in the background, sorry. <laughs> I did mute it, but I can unmute it if you're... Really? All right, fine. After the first question, I'll unmute it. See, already we're down to just five possible people that can get a perfect score on this game. I told you, I warned you it was hard. Uh, for those of you who chose Miley Cyrus, she was dethroned this week by Morgan Wallen. So she was number one, SZA was number two, and Morgan Wallen just entered the chart at number one. Now, yeah, thank you, by the way. The five of you thought it was me. I I did mention to you during the trivia prior to this that I can't sing, so maybe you thought I was like the keyboardist on some some of them. I don't know. Anyway, it's going to be a lonely key, a lonely uh, scoreboard for the first question, but I have a feeling we'll pick it up with this one. Ready? There you go. <laughs> that was not the reaction I expected to get. 
a bunch of mathematicians in a room and the reaction to seeing pi is, oh God, disdain. <laughs> Hey, see that? Submissionally better. 3.14159265535. There it is, number 10. Oh, yeah, I forgot. I was supposed to unmute this, right? Here you go. We'll unmute it so you can hear this awful music in the background. Awful. Who, who, you guys want prizes, right? The music is awful, right? You're going you're gonna to join my confirmation bias right now, right? <laughs> Here we go. Now, now I'm starting to hear it. I hear the answers. I don't hear the music. Awesome. <laughs> How's that for a nice, even distribution? <laughs> for what it's worth i don't know if any of you noticed in the picture that ben affleck is literally pointing at matt damon <laughs> yeah all right S still got time to come back folks you still got time Really is just kind of very low music. Beautiful. There we go. 29 correct. I did a survey once where I asked a bunch of people how many sides are on a dodecagon and then how many are on an eneagon. And they were like, oh, I don't know what enea is. And oh, enea decagon, enea is the Greek root for nine. So. Nine and ten make nine. There we go. The halfway point of the game already. I told you it's hard. <laughs> Very small sprinkles. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So Johnson and Wales opened in 1914. Do you guys know when Malloy opened? Anybody? What year was Malloy opened? Oh, wow. 1955 was Malloy. So Robert Downey Jr. is 58. Tom Holland's 27. Scar Joe is, 20, is 38. Moving right along. Told you. <laughs> yep. Shawshank was in the notorious 1992 year where it had to go up against Forrest Gump and Pulp Fiction, and it lost all of them. Uh, all right, onward we go. Uh, Not bad. World War One was 20th century. By the way, we're in room three. What are we? 399. So 339 times five is 1695. So the year 1695, 17th century. That's the only one that was 17th century. Uh, World War One, 20th century. Hundred Years War was 14th century. War of the Roses was 15th century. Ooh, that's tight right there. Here we go. Three questions to go. Uh, 
I did actually mention where I'm from. So. <laughs> nice. Yukon. Any other Yukons in here? Nobody? All right. You got out of the <laughs> LSU on the women's. Oh. <laughs> well, two of you have clearly given up hope on winning. <laughs> My my dad will be very happy. <laughs> All right. The last question. Here it is. What could it possibly be? <laughs> All of the above. <laughs> <laughs> all of the above was close but no i'm not ariana grande so i can't even claim to be that if i wanted to nor will i demonstrate hip-hop for you so here we go let's see who my prize winners are we have marcus we have john i hope you all know who you are because i don't <laughs> Well, I do know one, so maybe well done. All right, so where are Marcus and John? All right. Congratulations. <laughs> All right, so I think that your next uh, presenter starts at two, which means you have nine minutes for questions, go. <laughs> or comments or whatever, I don't care. You want me? I can put it back up. <laughs> yep. I always say that when there's no questions, it means that I'm such a thorough, dynamic speaker that there's no need. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You teach for 20 plus years and you get nothing. My favorite movie? Actually, it's The Nightmare Before Christmas. Yeah, My Nightmare Before Christmas is my, my all-time favorite movie. Although I'm, I'm much more inclined to answer that question on a genre by genre basis. <laughs> my favorite Marvel movie? I would probably have to say uh, the second Thor. Yeah. Yep. I did not because I'm terrible at anything that's first person, and I also am really, really bad with jump scares. So I I tend to stay away from any movie, any any type of uh, game that I know that if I walk into a deserted hallway, I'm about to be attacked by something. Um, I also haven't watched the show. <laughs> Cult classic movie. I mean, if you're asking me what my favorite is to see in a theater, it's Rocky Horror. I love seeing Rocky Horror in theaters. Um, maybe Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. <laughs> I, I would have to think about the definition of cult classic for a while, too. So since you were talking a good bit about um, like, you know, cultural norms and like society is very popular and normal. Mm -hmm. um, um, we see very few countercultural comedians today, but the same that are here and the really be popular, like Lord Carver was a big one. We have a big one today, it's probably Bill Burr. Because uh, I think people appreciate those that go put the envelopes of their comedic purposes. Um, you have to be careful with that, though, because then you get into it's this is like what happened to Kathy Griffin. And you all know what happened to Kathy Griffin when she was basically banned from a lot of social media after she posted the Trump of her beheading or beheading Donald Trump. Uh, she got into a lot of 
trouble for that. And so like if you these days, if you take something too far, it's gonna come back and haunt you. Yeah. Uh, but George Carlin, yeah, I I mean <laughs> that the the words that you can't say on television pops yeah. up in every time I turn on the TV to like one of the classic stations like Game State or anything else. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. How, how do you how do you manage when your idea of pop culture uh, is, isn't known by some of your students? I love it. I, I I don't even need to manage. I encourage it. I think that people should have different uh, definitions. And I one of the first things that I discuss in my stats pop culture class, I have an initial assignment that it tells me. So they have to define pop culture, but in in defining pop culture, they have to tell me something about their background. And what their background in pop culture is and what led them to this point where they believe something is popular or they like things. So I love hearing what cultures they came from. So like we we had a group of seven students from Indonesia that I, I got to teach them for a term in statistics. And they, they taught me all sorts of things that they were into. But the one connection that we had was the NBA. And they like they love Indonesia. It's NBA is extremely popular in Indonesia, and so they were they were telling me all about how that led to certain cultures going on in their society that weren't prevalent in the United States, and how it connects and how we also are separate. And it's it's fascinating. It's I I actually love when that happens. Love it. So I have maybe I'm I'm trying to find out a slightly different angle on it, which is. When you discover that a student, or how do you encourage a student to uh, express their ignorance? In other words, to tell you, I don't, I don't get that reference, and still make it fun and positive. I mean, if you connect with them on any level in that anchoring process that Osvaldo was talking about, then you're good. Uh, as long as you make some sort of a connection to something that they already are aware of, that's usually how something gets fixed. So within the cognitive dissonance that we were talking about, when you don't have that ability when your brain just wants to zone out because it doesn't mesh with what you previously thought you knew and to try to change them around it, it is incredibly difficult and it's one of those questions now that goes around all the time with politics because we we have such a, a a huge disparity in this country now where people are like oh well how do i convince republicans of this how do i convince democrats of this and so on and so forth it's like well just share all you can do is be open and if as long as you're open and honest then i i can only go as far as you'll allow me. If, if eventually I reach a brick wall and they're like, no, uh, I truly believe that this happened, that man didn't walk on the moon, that climate change is not real and so on and so forth. You can only do so much. And at, at some point, as long as it doesn't affect their grade, <laughs> for me, it's okay. If it, we, we've shared our opinions. And if you leave a little bit more informed, then I'm happy. Yep. The, the class is that you create. Mm -hmm. um, Target math majors and students? Nope. Um, so my classes are again called ILS, which is integrated integrative learning studies. And that basically in at JWU, you have to take a 2000 level and a 4000 level ILS. And that's what my classes are. Uh, the ones that pop culture, science, superheroes, and eventually science and love will all be in ILS courses. So anybody who just wants to take something that sounds different. Is going to take my class, yeah. So there's no prereqs. No, no prereqs whatsoever. Uh, stats of pop culture, you do have to have a senior status because it's a four thousand level, and you also have to have had statistics. But basically, just about every major at JWU takes statistics. Yeah. I don't want to run into. I just want to make sure. <laughs> And if any of you want my business card, feel free. Yeah. Excellent job. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> Here, thank you. About a train here. Oh yes. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I appreciate and it. My wife's a psychologist. She really appreciates uh, having something she can figure to. Does she know? Wait, is she here? She yeah. isn't. Okay. Do you do you know who Paul Bloom is? He he's the one that I'm taking that class. He I, that I just finished his class. Amazing. It was one of the best experiences of my entire life. It almost made me want to like minor in psych all like 
retroactively. Let's do this one question. So I'm a math major, but I also have a double minor in political science and sociology. That's a lot. Yeah. Uh, and one thing that you kind of touched on in terms of like how society views something and, you know, you mentioned politics into it. Um, with identity. Uh, sorry, it's kind of just, uh, Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Okay, no, I just need to. Oh, oh that's my turn. Okay. All this and such. Thanks. Like a say, building a judgment. Is there any kinds of that? Is there any kinds of building read it? Yeah. As long as you So, so that allows the clicker to run. Yeah. And it yeah. knows what like the document yeah. or. Yeah. or Hmm? How does it? How does it know? Like to click on a certain document. That's got a. That's got a turn on. Uh, it's it's like oh, I see. Okay, so. Um, uh, close this can you close this session, please? Close this. Yeah, yeah it. It. Okay. Uh, I think you could take that. You could minimize that. Okay. Uh, still. Yeah, she's still alive. Still alive. Still alive. Okay. Yeah. Oh, oh, we should stop the uh, recording. Yeah. Right? Stop the bill. We're going to test your clickers, make sure it works. Before yeah. You. yeah. Okay. You can take it from there. Okay.